Hey everyone, today we're going to be talking about blockage is bad. And while that sounds kind of like a kindergarten theory or idea, it really actually follows a lot of really good information um, when it comes to um, healthcare and uh, traffic. So before we start jumping into the body, which has all sorts of different chemistries and hormones and different ways it can be blocked, let's start with something simple that we have all been impacted by. Let's start with traffic. Think about a time when you've been in a traffic jam. What kinds of things did you have to think about as you were going through? Did you just have to wait as the traffic cleared? Were you able to reroute and get around the area of blockage? Were you in a hurry or were you just coming home from work and you could get home at any time? The different ideas uh, when we are in a traffic jam are very, very similar to the ideas that we have when we have a blockage in the body, is what was blocked, what's being impacted, can I still get through or is it completely blocked? And what's gonna happen if I wait? Is this something I can sit and wait for or is something gonna happen to the tissue beyond the blockage that's going to cause detrimental harm? So let's talk about um, coming to school. Think about your route when you come to school. What is the easiest and most efficient route? So think about, do you, have, do you base it on traffic lights or do you base it on um, the flow of the day, uh, the different times? That's very similar to if we have different disease processes that are stacking up on our patient. Um, if we have a patient that just has a blockage, we just have to fix that one thing. But most of our patients do not just have one single disease. So there's lots of different pieces that go into caring for someone with a blockage. So we're going to say that Southeast Community College is our is our where we want to go. It has two main entrance. It has 84th Street and it has an O Street entrance. And thinking about the direction that you're coming and where you want to go, how do you get here? So let's just say somebody had an unfortunate day and they got in a car wreck right at that 84th Street entrance. Now, depending on how you come to school or how people get into school or what time of day it is can really depend on what's going on. So oftentimes people come down 84th Street and they come in that way, they come up 84th Street, they come that way, people come in from um, the Seward, or not Seward, sorry, um, Eagle area, and people come in from this way to get in. So now we have that blockage. We now are gonna say people are gonna start um, wanting to all go to the O Street entrance, right? Because they're going to start deciding they need to reroute themselves. Now you've got all this traffic backed up because this traffic coming in is not just going to Southeast Community College. They may be coming into Lincoln to go to Best Buy or to go to Gateway Mall, depending on what they're going. Maybe they're going to work and this is just their way into town. So these tra this traffic did not decrease because there was a blockage on the 84th Street. Now you also have all this traffic backing up because they can't turn in like they usually would. And now instead of having this traffic lightened, you now have all that traffic backed up. And mind you, all the people in these cars are not just people that are um, going to Southeast Community College. Some of them are going to work. Some of them might be heading to Omaha. Who knows, but they're definitely not all coming to the college. So now we have a backup of all these people whose day is being impacted because of one area of blockage. We frequently see this as we're working with patients is that lots of areas get impacted because of one area of blockage. Now, if there were multiple airways into Southeast, it wouldn't be as big of a deal. People would simply reroute. Um, Southeast um, has not a lot of roads into it, so there's simply only two ways in, meaning you're going through one of them. And if one's blocked, now 50% of that traffic is all coming in to the one side. That's going to cause a lot of blockage. When we are thinking about blockage, we need to understand and think about where it is. Where is the blockage happening, all right? Um, and we need to think about what is it impacting?
right? What is it impacting? Because now, like we talked about, this just isn't just impacting the, the people that are trying to get to the college. It's now impacting all the other people that are in this area of town, trying to get to their jobs, trying to get their kids to school, and all of those pieces that go with it. Some of the things that we're going to have to start thinking about is we're going to have to start about thinking about um, is that blockage, is it a complete or a partial occlusion? Because that's going to change how much we have um, to get through it. If someone can still be eking by, but maybe we usually get, you know, 10 cars in that turn lane, and now because of that blockage, we can only get four. It's still getting them by, but just not nearly at the speed that it is. Or is it on one side of the road versus both sides of the road? So if it's a complete blockage, it would be taking out both sides and no one's going to be getting through. But if it's just on one side, so if we take our little eraser here and kind of erase that, um, it's only on one side of it. Well, that means that um, cars are still able to kind of come in but maybe they have to go a little bit slower. So now that's causing some slowdown, but not necessarily a complete blockage. And you're gonna see that when we work with patients, especially our spinal cord injury patients, is it a complete sever of the spine or a complete blockage of communication from the top to the bottom? Or is it just a partial where they have some mo movement, but not all because of the amount of block it's been blocked. Um, the other thing we wanna know is, how can I get to where I need to go, right? So that's the other thing when we're driving, right? We need to know where, where is that, where is the traffic obstruction? Um, what's it all impacting? How much uh, rerouting do I have to do? And um, how can I still get to where I need to go? Because that's what our body is trying to do, is how can I get where I need to go? So if you think about your blood cells, where do they need to go? Where are they trying to get to? And are they now going to be all backed up because they can't get to where they need to do? How can I get to where I need to go? All right. And that might be how we think when we're working um, with ourselves in our car. But when it's our body, it's how do I get, how does that cell get to where it needs to go? How does that nerve impulse go where it needs to go? How does this education get to where it needs to get to so that this patient can see effectively take care of their diabetes. When we think of blockage, let's think of it a little more abstractly. Let's not think of it as just a physical blockage, but it can be a mental blockage. It can be an emotional blockage. It could be a spiritual blockage. Blockages don't just happen physically, although we will be primarily focusing on the, the physical blockages in this course. Um, but you can think of it as I still need to find ways to effectively get around some of those blockages so that people can have good care and progress and heal and get healthy. Um, when it comes to blockage, we talked about, you know, is it a complete or is it a partial? Because that really changes um, our nursing interventions. If it's a complete blockage, that's probably becoming more of an urgent situation. Because if we do not restore blood flow, if we do not restore flow, even flow of traffic, what's gonna happen? People aren't gonna get where they need to go. You're gonna have a lot of anger. You're gonna have a lot of hurt. When it comes to blood flow or um, maybe neural impulses, what's gonna happen if those things don't um, get to where they need to? So really important to think about if you're talking about a transmission of something and we have a blockage, what's going to happen below the area of blockage or beyond the area of blockage. So if this is blood flow, what's going to happen to this tissue that's beyond the area of blood flow because that blood is being blocked? It's going to die, right? We're going to start having um, cell death, which in turn leads to tissue death, all right? This becomes really important as we start talking about um, some of things like heart attacks and strokes. Um, time is tissue. And if that tissue is not saved, is, if that blockage is not opened and flow restored, it's not just getting being late to a job, it's actual death of tissue. 
and that can lead to um, life ending and life altering consequences. So our goals when it comes to a blockage is to restore flow. That's as simple as it gets, restore flow. That is our goal for every type of blockage that we have, whether it be a cognitive blockage, a neuro blockage, um, any type of blockage we have, we wanna restore flow. How are we gonna do that? We are going to either remove the blockage if we can, or we're gonna reroute it, okay? So when it comes to our interventions, all of our interventions that we have are going to be based on the idea of remove or reroute, all with the goal to restore flow. Now, if we are in an urgent situation, I as a nurse cannot go in and remove a clot, right? But I can maintain flow as best I can. So one of our interventions then also becomes to maintain the flow. All right, and so we're gonna maintain that flow the best we can um, until we get people to where they need to be. So then our thinking and priority thinking becomes really, really important um, as we're working with these patients because you guys will be working with patients in clinics, in um, long-term care facilities, rehabs. I mean, that's just to name a few. I'm sure there's a vast variety of other places that um, we'll be working. And so we can't, reroute something um, in, in the clinic. We can't remove um, uh, something in, in the um, long-term care facility. So it's really important that we may have to maintain the flow until we can get people to where they need to go. But knowing that all of our cares are going to be based on that idea of remove, reroute, that's when a blockage has happened. But we will talk about preventative things because we try and prevent a lot of blockages from happening in the beginning so that we don't have to worry about this kind of complication happening. So I wanna talk, since we've talked about the road, let's talk a little bit about people, all right? So we've got a person here, and what I have is I have two different um, uh, body maps, basically. And one is a person with, this is our, our vascular system. Okay, these should look pretty familiar to you. And this is our nervous system. Now notice our nervous system um, is very similar and follows that same kind of pattern that our vascular system follows. And so it's really important to understand that a lot of things happen to the vascular system um, that, happen also to the nervous system, but they are separate systems, but they run beside each other. It's sort of like when you have um, those roads that are the, the side roads um, off the internet or off the internet, off the interstate, uh, and you see those little side roads that are running beside the interstate, and those are access roads, and they make it easier access. Well, the nervous system and the vascular system, they run side by side, easier access. Blood flow is good to the nervous system then, and we can um, have nerve interventions. So that's why you'll see problems that'll happen from a blood blockage. So a blockage in the vascular system will cause discomfort or pain in the nervous system because the blood flow being blocked causes um, hypoxic issues to the tissue uh, um, surrounding the nervous system. And so you'll see that people will have pain. So something like um, if we put a blood clot in this person's calf, right, that's going to be a DVT, deep vein thrombosis. It's going to be a clot in, in the tissue or in that vascular system. Now, what are we going to see from this person? We're probably going to see that area start to get red, um, start to get swollen as the body tries to figure out what to do and how to reroute blood flow. Now, if this is an older person, kind of cool things that happens to older people is they have what they call collateral circulation. They have more side roads. They have more access roads. Their body has developed those as their venous or vascular system has become um, damaged or tight or diseased or whatever. They have developed um, alternate road paths. So sometimes you'll see a lot, they still have really nice adequate blood flow because they have collateral circulation. They've had time to build that. Younger people have more trouble with um, clots because we don't have um, the collateral circulation as well. 
I say we, I'm not super young. So, um, but it's really important that we figure that out when we're working with people. Just because we see a swollen area and pain doesn't mean that they have a complete occlusion either. They may be able to still um, be pumping through um, as the vessels dilate more. So that's what we'll kind of see. When we see like a DVT, you'll see redness and we'll see swelling. They might complain of um, pain as the tissue swells and puts pressure on the nervous system. They may complain of like numbness and tingling to the feet as um, the, the nervous system starts to kind of be compressed and not able to get nerve impulses through. So things that we're gonna do to treat this, well, I remember we talked about where our goal is to restore flow to that foot into that tissue. We have to either take this person in and have them do scans so they can see the clot and then they're either going to go in and try to remove the clot or we might try and do a um, thrombolytic that will destroy the clot. Now, if we're doing preventative stuff to keep people from getting clots, think about what we do. We do anticoagulants so they don't develop the clot. We might do, um, uh, we might do the compression stockings, you know, or SCD machines so that they um, don't, so that the vascular system um, helps get that blood flow back out because anytime blood is stagnant, blood likes to clot, it's just doing its job. So really important, again, our goal is to restore flow and we're gonna restore flow, um, the best way we know how would be to go in and remove the clot itself. Otherwise, what we might have to do is we might have to give a thrombolytic or we might have to just watch them and see if their body um, reabsorbs it depending on uh, the severity of the clot and the formation. What I wanna talk about is there's another thing that causes us to have problems with flow. And that's sort of like what I would call road construction or the lack of efficient flow. So something's going on that's causing um, the flow not to go transmit um, appropriately or transmit through. And so this is where we get into um, a lot of our cardiac rhythms. And I know it seems really weird and there's other videos on here that will help you understand this. And I just wanna let you guys know, I am not a cardiac nurse. Uh, I don't do hearts well, but I do um, in this fact that what I look at for a cardiac rhythm is if it is life sustaining or not, okay? not life-sustaining, okay? Those are the two things that I look for. Is it life-sustaining or is it not life-sustaining? And we talk about something like AFib, atrial fibrillation. Um, you know, it's like, okay, we gotta do something about it. Well, are they walking? Are they talking? Think about the patients you've taken care of with um, AFib. Are they walking and talking and eating and spending time with their families and all that kind of stuff? Yes then it's a pretty life-sustaining rhythm. It's doing its job. It may not be efficiently doing its job. It may not be as effective as another rhythm, normal sinus would be, but it does work. So when you're thinking about um, cardiac rhythms, start putting them into two different categories, life-sustaining or not life-sustaining. How um, this works is we have the SA node up on the top, and remember, these are our atria on the top and our ventricles kind of on the bottom. And so how a cardiac rhythm works, when we look at the electrical current, what we're seeing is the pump of the heart, the electrical flow through the heart, which then tells us the pump. So we've got the SA node shoots down to the um, AV node, and then it contracts through. So we're seeing this boom, 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 constantly going through this heart. Now, what's really cool and really a pain in the rear about, car about hearts is that every cardiac cell can be a leader or a follower. That's all good, except for when you get too many leaders, then we become out of rhythm. 
So when you get a leader who is up here, right? So now you used to just have this nice pattern, which this nice pattern would be normal sinus. And normal sinus, you have a nice P wave, which is your atria, your QRS, which is your ventricles, and then you have a T wave. Ooh, that's really bad to hear. And you have a T wave. And that T wave is the repolarization of, it's kind of a little quick mini reboot of the system. So you have your P wave, your QRS, and your T, all right? And those are gonna be constantly redoing. Now, when you have this other one that decides to be a leader, now we have the atria just quivering because now you have both of these pieces going at the same time and they're causing all sorts of havoc, okay? Because they're not communicating. Um, this little guy decides he doesn't care when he's gonna happen. So then you have a bunch of P waves, a QRS, and then a bunch more P waves. When we have this, our atria are quivering. When our atria quiver, that is not a good thing. Our atria need to have, be a nice, effective pump. When they are not, they cause problems. So this would then cause clots because in here, let's see if it'll show up real well. In here, blood is now pooling because the atria are quivering. While AFib is a life-sustaining rhythm, it can cause its own problems. It can cause clots to start forming. And if clots start forming, they're gonna eventually, when they do get a nice sinus rhythm happen, they are gonna um, shoot those clots out. AFib is probably one of the biggest, or it is the leading cause of ischemic strokes because all of a sudden those clots are getting shot out into the body, up into the brain and causing a blockage. Now no longer is the blockage in the heart, but the blockage is now um, up into the brain, still in the vascular system. So it's kind of interesting. Again, what they'll go do for this guy is they'll try and go in and shut that one down. We choose for AFib, there's a lot, lots of treatments, right? There's chemical, which are all our medications. So your amiodarone, your um, metoprolols, all that kind of stuff that we give for AFib, pacerones, um, uh, Coreg, all that stuff that we can give for AFibs um, frequently does has blood pressure issues along with it. But that can help get our um, atria into a good rhythm. The other thing we can do is we can shock it. So we talk about cardioverting. And when we cardiovert, we can only shock a rhythm. I know you guys have all seen on the TV shows that the asystole, that boop, um, and they'll be like, we need to shock them. We don't shock that rhythm. There's nothing to shock. It's not like when we shock people that we're putting electricity into them and getting them to keep going. Otherwise, we'd be able to put batteries in people and make it work. It doesn't. So a not life-sustaining rhythm, this would be asystole. It is not life-sustaining, okay? It has no rhythm. Um, this is when we're going to do CPR on, that kind of stuff. But back to our AFib, we're going to cardiovert them. We're going to try and get it into a, a, a rhythm that we need to get it in. All right. We're going to um, kind of try and remove this cell as much as possible, either chemically or through shock. If none of that works, we'll take in, they can take in a little cool thing um, and like do a little thing where they, what they call ablate it where they basically um, carterize that cell when they can map them out. Again, that's getting way into the cardiac world. Um, if you like that stuff, man, go ahead, dig into it, but not my, not my cup of tea. Just know that we have ways of trying to help with AFib um, by removing the signal that's causing the issue, okay? So that, the, so that the pump can work effectively. So that's like the day that all the orange cones go away and the traffic can flow nice and free. Um, it's now we can flow and our blood is gonna flow through us. Make sure that you're looking um, through your modules so that you can work through learning the cardiac rhythms a little bit better. Um, just remember, life-sustaining, there are lots of rhythms that are not normal, but they are life-sustaining. There are lots of um, rhythms that are not life-sustaining. Those become urgent situations and we need to be able to do something about them. The one thing I would say is always assess your patient. Um, I've had a patient before uh, that 
he looked like he was in VTAC and which is this guy. So if you ever see that rhythm on a monitor, that's not a good rhythm. Um, and we all go running in. If you want to see a lot of nurses go really fast, that's the rhythm you'll get. That's one of them that'll get you in there fast. And what it was is he was top, tapping his V lead, which is the brown lead in the center of his chest. And it was making him look like VTAC. VTAC would be these guys quivering, not the atria. Your ventricles quivering is a very bad day. Um, he wanted ice cream. Uh, apparently he pushed his call light and we hadn't responded quick enough. And so he'd figured out that VTAC got us very, very quickly. We did recommend that he not play uh, um, Peter and the Wolf with that one. Cause man, um, you know, calling Wolf on that one, eventually you're gonna desensitize the nurses and that would not be a good one for us to be desensitized to. So as you're working through your cardiac rhythms, just think about, is this a life-sustaining rhythm? Is blood still flowing? Maybe not effectively and maybe not as efficiently as it should be, but it's still getting to where it needs to get. And then think about as we're working through the blockage, how do we restore flow? Do I need to maintain it until I get more direct care or can I restore flow by myself with medications or um, with different doctor's orders? Um, but how are we gonna restore flow? Think about what's happening above and below the obstruction. Um, is, is the communication um, completely fine in the neuro system? And then it gets to a certain area where there's been damage to the spine and now it's no longer getting through. Is it a partial or complete? Is there complete, is it a complete um, occlusion and nothing's getting through? Or is something getting through and <coughs> we need to, to fix the rest? Hope you have fun learning and we'll see you in lab.